started. Thank you all for coming out on a chilly night to learn more about the benefits of an urban uh, tree canopy. I'm Dr. Amanda Herzog. I am the chair of the Environmental Advisory Board. And our mission is to educate and advocate for environmental issues, especially those that affect our city. And so we are very happy to support Abby and her tree initiative to um, have a tree canopy. Um, I have a few announcements. As of yesterday, Royal Oak is in a recycle off Madison Heights. So I want everyone to recycle even more than they are already doing so we can win. Um, I also <laughs> want to invite anyone who is um, wanting to come to our monthly uh, Environmental Advisory Board meeting. There, um, it'll, the next one will be February 28th uh, at the Senior Center at 7 o'clock. And then our big event of the year is our Earth Day event on April 21st at the Farmer's Market. So I hope you can all be there. Um, we have our speaker, but uh, Commissioner Kyle Dubuck would like to make a few, a few quick statements about what the city's doing as far as our tree canopy, and then we'll get on with our show. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. I'm Commissioner Kyle Dubuck. I have been serving on the Environmental Advisory Board for about eight years. I've been the Commission's representative for about six years since I was first elected in uh, 2011. And uh, clearly, uh, environmental sustainability needs to be a top priority for a city. And maintenance of our tree canopy um, is you know, one of those top priorities, along with reducing our carbon footprint and reducing water runoff that we're putting in the sewer system. So uh, I've been pushing for several years to get real aggressive, sustainable policies in place. Um, we're starting to get some traction on that. A couple of things we've done over the last few years have been, um, we actually just at the last meeting uh, approved, we had directed staff about a year ago to bring us uh, a policy for planned development uh, where we want a real tree assessment. We want to know exactly what the developer's plans are. We want the authority to tell them uh, how many trees need to go back on that space. We want to, at the very least one for one, if they're removing grandfather, grandmother trees, we, we have the authority to tell them, you know, we want three, four trees, and they have to be as close to the size, you know, as you can actually replant, uh, of the removed tree as possible. So that's in place. Um, we've dedicated, uh, in the last two cycles, $200,000 a year uh, to easement uh, tree planting. That's out of community development block grant funds. So that's been about 1,000 trees a year over the last two years. We're still not where we need to be because of disease and, and age. Um, we're, we're still tree negative. And that's very concerning to me. I have three children here, and my priority is making sure that they have as many lovely trees, if not more, if possible, um, when they're my age, as, as we have right now. So um, that, that's a policy priority for us as well. Um, we've also said anytime the city takes out a tree, uh, be it because the tree is diseased or age or because of an infrastructure project, the city must offer, if it's in the easement, uh, that homeowner the opportunity to have that tree replaced um, at, at the city's expense. It used to be that they say, oh, you want a new tree, you can order one for like 220 bucks. If we're taking it out, uh, the city should be replacing that at least one for one. I'm in discussions right now with staff because I'm pretty sure that I made that, uh, that policy two for one. If the owner wants it, although most people don't want two trees in their easement because of you know, the pipes and everything and then the sidewalk lifting. Um, but I do want to be more aggressive. We need to ensure that more we have more trees next year than we had last year. So uh, we're pursuing that as well. One of the things we're talking about with Abby is, now that we've talked about plan development that actually have to go before the Planning Commission, what can we do to protect trees on private property? And that's you know, why we decided to have this discussion today. So one, we as a community all understand that our trees don't just have an aesthetic and environmental value, but they actually have an environmental value to our city. And that's something that matters to all of us, whether or not the tree's on my property. If it's your tree and you're taking it down, you know, there's, there's a loss for me and for my family and for my property value. And, and there's, a, there's a real you know, monetary value to that. So what can we do from a policy perspective to protect those trees? Right now, it's a property rights issue. If you own that property, you own that tree, you can do as you like with that tree. Other cities have passed ordinances uh, that restrict the removal of trees uh, in some ways on private property. There's been a lot of discussion I know on social media about restricting builders. Builders, property owners, just like I'm a property owner, so we can't say if you're a builder, you can't, and if you own the property, you can, if I want to put it in debt. So trying to find that balance is the conversation that we're in the middle of right now, and I'm really excited you're all here so we can all have the same information and have that conversation together. So again, thank you all for being here. Again, we are 
my goal as a commissioner is to make sure we are a shining model of a green, sustainable city in southeastern Michigan. Obviously, Ann Arbor is a few steps ahead of us. Um, but there's a real opportunity for us to be a leader here. And we need the support of everyone in this room if we're really going to advance policy that can make that happen on all of those fronts. Trees, water runoff, carbon footprint, renewable energy. There's a cost of those things. There's a capital layout for those things. I think it's worth it. So um, please you know, uh, enjoy the conversation. We, I'm sure we'll hear a lot of great information. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. For those of you who came in a little bit recently, uh, my name is Bill Lawrence. I'm the president of Relief Michigan. Uh, regarding my background, I have two degrees in forestry from the University of Michigan. I've been in the industry for 43 years. I was a city forester in Ann Arbor for 28 years. I've owned a private tree care company, and I, at this point in stage of my life, I'm just consulting now. Um, and I volunteer a lot, like this. I don't get paid to be president of this organization. It's a nonprofit. Um, and I belong to the professional association in, this, um, in the state of Michigan and have been on the board two times now uh, over the last 40 years. So I still spend a lot of time, but it's just not at the profit end of it so much. Um, this is going to be fun tonight, I think. I, I'm really interested in all the concerns the city has because that's what I did for so many years. I'm going to go through this, which talks some a little bit about what Relief Michigan is all about, and, but most of it is going to be about the value and benefits of trees in communities. Um, and if somebody has a question while I'm doing this, don't hesitate to throw something at me if I'm not looking at you. Um, I'd be glad to stop and we can talk about it. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because I want to get to the, the crux of the issues in this community. Um, which are more <laughs> than just tree values. <clears throat> Benefits of the urban tree canopy. How did you do that? The bar? Yeah, the bar. It you had to, had to click, to on, click it. on this. Oh, uh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am. I am technically challenged. I'm of that generation. <clears throat> um, Relief Michigan is a statewide nonprofit. We were established in 1988, so we're all pushing 30 years. So we are not kind of a here and gone uh, organization. This has been done by volunteers for 30 years, and it's been very successful. We plant trees to rebuild Michigan's urban and rural canopies. We educate the public of the value of trees and the need to properly select, plant, and maintain them. We partner with community groups on local tree-related projects such as plantings and educational workshops. Over the past 30 years, we have worked with over 400 Michigan communities. And it's not just Southeast Michigan communities. We've gone to the UP to do this also. Um, and we've planted over 30,000 trees. And these are not small trees. They're inch and a half to two inch caliper trees. That's trunk diameter. Those, so those are six to seven or eight foot tall trees. And we do it mostly with volunteers. Many of our members are green industry people, such as myself and our executive director. Um, so that we, when we organize tree plantings, uh, we usually have somebody with our experience on the site. So that's why it has been so successful, because there's a real quality control issue when you have uh, 25 or 30 volunteers trying to plant uh, 25 or 30 trees in, in a matter of three or four hours. But it has been very great, uh, very good um, uh, uh, synergy or cooperation in that process. It's been quite successful. Our field work is the tree plantings I talked about uh, and the Michigan Big Tree Hunt, which is essentially a contest that runs over a two-year period where any a uh, person in the state of Michigan can enter a tree that they think might be the biggest uh, of, an, of a species in Michigan. And then every two years, we have uh, uh, professionals go out and, and uh, uh, take the statistics on those trees uh, to qualify the um, uh, relationship with all the other entries, and then have a, a 
a ceremony in Lansing uh, to award the winners. It's a big, wonderful Arbor Day event. Um, our education side is we do forestry network meetings uh, with groups such as the Saginaw Bay Watershed, the Grand, River, Grand Traverse Bay Watershed, the Lower Grand River Watershed, and other sort of quasi-government um, organizations, uh, conservation districts, et cetera. And we also do homeowner edu education in workshops and seminars with a variety of tree planting uh, top or tree tree related topics. Uh, we have a couple presentations coming up. Uh, one is about Oakwilt and Hillsdale uh, in March, and then in Springfield Township, uh, tree care and maintenance in May. And these are just the first few plantings that we have going on this spring. Funding for our projects is primarily this. This uh, these educational pro uh, seminars, like tonight, are funded by the Department of Natural Resources Urban Community Forestry Program. We also get uh, our funding from the generosity of people like yourself, who care about trees and a healthy environment, and the future of our vibrant Michigan communities. Detroit Edison Consumers Energy has have also been uh, great. Uh, contributors to our organization. What is an urban tree canopy? The canopy cover is the footprint or surface area of the land covered by the combined leaves, branches, and trunks of all the standing trees in a given area. And it says when viewed from above, but it's the same thing from viewed from below. <clears throat> there is an individual tree canopy. We were talking about that a little bit earlier as, as compared to the urban tree canopy. When speaking of individual trees, refer to the tree's spread of branchings, branches and leaves as the canopy or the crown of the tree of that individual. An urban tree canopy is the collective whole of all the individual trees within a specified community. Um, that picture, I think, shows uh, that a, a fairly dense, at least residential area of uh, ur uh, urban tree canopy density. Why is an urban tree canopy important? Trees are problem solvers. They have many benefits which are directly proportional to the amount of tree canopy. They have economic benefits, social benefits, and environmental benefits. Um, here we have <laughs> trees. Money doesn't grow on trees, but in a certain sense, it, it, they do. Trees. Uh, the average annual net benefit of a mature tree in somebody's yard is $85 annually. And on a public street, it's $113. And I'll show you the references for the, all these statistics. <clears throat> Trees can reduce stormwater runoff by millions of gallons per year, thus reducing the cost to the city manage, uh, management for the runoff. A, a sidebar that the city of Ann Arbor applied for a grant um, to the federal government, and I can't remember the agency now, but it had to do with stormwater, and they were able to um, fund a full-time forester just to deal with stormwater management for the city of Ann Arbor. Home landscapes with trees sell more quickly and are worth 5 to 15% more than homes without trees. Trees are only are the only part, this is my favorite one, the trees are the only part of the city's infrastructure that appreciate over time. There was a long time when the city, when the infrastructure of a city was nothing but concrete or wires, sidewalks, telephone poles, and that and the like. But over the years, the industry, tree industry, has been able to convince uh, planning departments and engineering departments in cities that trees are part of the infrastructure. And if you think about it, they're more valuable the older they get. And no, no other part of the infrastructure works that way. <clears throat> People shop longer and make more purchases in a business district where trees are present. Uh, I think Ann Arbor is a classic example, if anybody's familiar with Main Street in Ann Arbor, that occurred in the mid-60s, and before that was nothing but parking places up and down that, that main street. 
and the merchants just moaned and moaned and moaned. But today, if you talk to those merchants or any of the merchants, I mean, they've turned over a lot now, but they wouldn't give up the trees on that street for anything. It's expanded their restaurants right out into the sidewalk. Um, every night in the summertime is busy on Main Street, every single night. <clears throat> Homes shaded by trees have lower air conditioning costs. I think that's, everybody knows that part of it. The social benefits. <clears throat> People walk and jog more, <clears throat> more on shaded streets, which encourages, encourages interaction with neighbors and increases the sense of community. Urban forests reduce health issues, such as respiratory diseases and skin cancer. Urban trees reduce ultraviolet radiation, especially UVB radiation, which is known to cause skin cancer. I've had it. Uh, a person standing in direct sunlight takes 20 minutes to get a sunburn. Under a tree providing 50% cover, it takes 50 minutes, and a tree under full shade, 100 minutes. Um, the US childhood asthma rates increased by 50% from 1980 to 2000. A study in New York City shows levels of asthma are the highest where density, tree density is the lowest. The rate of childhood asthma is 29% lower for every 400, 343 trees per square kilometer. Um, and again, the reference I can show you at the end. <clears throat> Visual exposure to settings with trees helps recover, recovery from stress within five minutes, as indicated by changes in blood pressure and muscle tension. Trees absorb and block sound, reducing sno noise pollution by as much as 40%. Tree Planting trees together can increase a sense of community and help reduce crime. <clears throat> this is a plant, one of our plantings in Royal Oak in September of last fall. Um, another one, uh, and it was in Menager Park, and the DNR participated in this. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and the environmental benefits can be up to 10 degrees cooler in the shade of a tree. Trees filter water moving through the soil to prevent contaminants from getting into rivers, lakes, and groundwater. Certain species break down pollutants commonly found in urban soils, groundwater, and runoff, such as metals, pesticides, and solvents. They're pretty powerful um, parts of our environment. Uh, they improve regional air quality. Trees absorb nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, and particulate matter from the atmosphere, as well as releases oxygen for us to use. They reduce summer air and water temperatures. Trees and shades, shade, trees and forests shade impervious surfaces, such as pavements, reducing the temperature of stormwater runoff. And this, um, the stormwater, the temperature of the stormwater runoff can have a shock effect when it runs into a stream full of fish and other aquatic life. Trees reduce air temperature, which reduces formation of pollutants that, the heat, that are heat dependent, such as ozone. Trees cool the air, store carbon, and reduce energy use, resulting in a reduction of power plant emissions. The, has anybody heard of this term, urban heat islands? Well, it's essentially what happens in communities relative to the surrounding suburbs and or rural areas. Um, it describes urban areas that are hotter than the nearby rural areas. When buildings, roads, and other infrastructure replace open land and vegetation, surfaces that were once permeable and moist become impermeable and dry. These changes cause urban regions to become warmer than their rural surroundings, forming an island of higher temperatures in the landscape. If you, if you pay attention to the, the weather report in this, throughout uh, four seasons of the year, uh, Detroit in the summertime is always warmer than it is in the uh, suburbs and in the rural communities, almost always. Um, it makes them a little bit warmer in the wintertime, but it, uh, all that concrete and stuff also is a terrible insulator, so it absorbs so much cold. Uh, what are the impacts of the herb, urban heat island? 
increased energy consumption, elevated emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases, compromised human health and comfort, and impaired water quality. What can you do as a community? Increase and maintain your urban forest. Urban tree canopy assessments are a good uh, uh, level of testing that. A quantifiable measurement of the canopy over your community and the benefits it provides. You can plant trees and you can um, maintain your, tree in, your existing tree inventory. Urban tree canopy assessment. A quick but rough estimate of the existing canopy can be obtained using iTree Canopy. This is available free from the Forest Service. With iTree Canopy, you review Google Maps aerial photographs at random points to conduct a cover assessment with a defined, within a defined project area. For the most accurate results, whoop, sorry about that. Um, the I, with iTree Canopy, you, you review Google Maps aerial, I read that part. For the most accurate results, using a contractor or a professional, they use a variety of data, tools, and analytical methodologies from various sources, including aerial imagery, census data, remote sensing technology, locally supplied data, scientific studies, and previous canopy um, analysis. You can use the link for a detailed explanation of how a contractor completes an urban tree canopy assessment. Um, so this the link is right there. This information, you can go a lot farther into what can be accomplished. What do you get from an urban tree canopy assessment? Uh, here's an example of a community that shows the tree canopy uh, percentage uh, relative to the and, uh, total acreage uh, in acres. 66% tree canopy. That's pretty darn good. Uh, other vegetation, 62%, and you can, uh, and so on down the line. And then on the right, there are five communities that have varying degrees of tree canopy percentage cover. Northport is up just north of Traverse City and it's a small little community on a beautiful area of uh, existing trees, but they've done well too to do a lot of planting. Uh, from that, you can prior produce a prioritized planting map. Uh, the different colors represent the, pro the low to very high priorities where uh, more trees, spaces are available for tree planting. Uh, the, the help community understand how much canopy it has and where there is room for more. Help see the impact. Um, you can help see the impact their trees are having. Uh, better manage the forest resources by understanding what you have. Uh, inventory the green infrastructure, account for all the tree cover the community has, identify land where new trees can be planted, plan for more trees in the future, prioritize those efforts, and identify problem areas and monitor your progress. Tree, tra tree canopy goals, uh, recommendations for metropolitan areas east of the Mississippi and the Pacific Northwest. I have no idea why that You'd have to look at that reference, but um, the average tree cover counting all zones is 40%. The suburban residential zones are 50% tree canopy cover. Urban residential so zones are 25. Central business districts, 15. The average goal for Michigan communities is 40%. Key findings from the assessment done in Elk Rapids by Davy Resources Group. 28% tree canopy, 21% impervious surface. Significant potential to impact stormwater through st strategic planting. Low levels of tree canopy along major streets, corridors, and community center. Significant planting potential for residential areas. Trees provide half million in benefits each year. And they got that from the tree canopy assessment. Uh, recommendations based on analysis from Elk Rapids provide aging trees appropriate care. That's maintain what you have, particularly uh, the mature and over mature. How can you, you as an individual, help with this? Plant trees. Um, 
these community tree planting events are not that difficult to organize. Uh, the one on the left was a 40 tree planting in Midland, and the one on the right was a 100 tree planting in Detroit. And that was real interesting in a park, <clears throat> but extremely successful with the amount of volunteers. Part of our volunteers came from um, one of the groups that was not able to attend. That di director of that volunteer group was a uh, corrections officer. So she got another corrections officer to bring two vans fulls of um, about to be paroled um, inmates over. And that way all of a sudden had our, our muscle to get this done. I mean, we had probably 30 or 40 volunteers, but this was 100 trees, so we needed some muscle. <laughs> it worked out great. Uh, tree inventories. It's another thing that uh, often is recommended after a canopy tree assessment. A tree canopy assessment is really a sampling of a community's tree population. A tree inventory can then take individual data uh, about uh, public trees uh, through the entire city. It provides data for the trees in your community, how many trees there are, where they're located, the condition, size, and species. Um, we'll create a management plan to, to keep the urban forest and canopy healthy, developing pruning cycles, uh, uh, scheduling inspections that will catch high-risk ri trees that should be removed, and identify areas that need more trees. What benefits does your tree provide? This is a national tree benefit calculator. You can do this yourself. If you look in the middle there, the print's a little light. Uh, this is an 18-inch London plane tree that provides $178 of benefits each year. And the, the pie chart there shows you the different dollar amounts in the different uh, categories, like uh, stormwater runoff or energy reduction. Uh, and you can do this by a tree, using a tree in your yard uh, by following this, um, the Tree Benefits Calculator website there. These are the references I was referring to. I'm going to come back to this, uh, but I want to just finish the last few slides. Uh, thanks to the public, thank yous to the public library for hosting us. Uh, the Environmental Advisory Board uh, for being in existence and the City of Royal Oak. Thank you very much. Uh, this is our website, our telephone number, um, and feel free to call us for assistance, information, or if you want to volunteer. Uh, and that's it. I appreciate it. And let's have questions and talk about some of the issues here in the community. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have funding to support homeowners who have a distressed, mature, ancient, very low tree, especially senior citizens? Uh, we don't have funding to actually do treatments on trees. Um, there's a possibility we might have a one of our uh, relief members in this area that could give you some advice on that. Um, so you might call the office and see if we can arrange something like that. There is a city forester in this city, right? And what is his name? Got two. That's, that's two people that should have good information relative to what you might want, what your options might be with that tree. Yes? Would that also be something that would be useful to find out what trees would be good to plant in your yard? Or is it just for existing trees? Well, that's just for existing trees. But the canopy assessment can at least help you decide where trees can be planted. And then um, our office or the foresters for the city can help you decide what kinds of trees would be best for a residential property. I mean, they, they're require their uh, responsibility is to pick out trees for the city uh, and a lot of the same trees that
go on streets will work well in urban areas and residential backyards. Yeah, I'm wondering, cities that do a good job of preserving their tree canopy, I guess, what do they do to dissuade people from chopping trees down? Do they use taxes and fees, or, and if they do, about what level? Well, that's, that's a big subject, but lots of cities start with a tree or woodlands ordinance. And what, that, what an ordinance usually includes is restrictions for cutting down trees, particularly in the, uh, the, the first priority is in undeveloped land and subdivision developers. That's, that's probably the most important thing for most communities. But then even individual, some communities have legislation that includes what you can and cannot do with trees on your own property. And when it's a single lot, it's usually very liberal what you can do. Uh, but there, there are examples where if it's a close to a property line, for example, and not close to a house, not preventing any kind of development, then the city has the authority to, to disallow that kind of a removal. Now, that, th those are just some examples. There are uh, communities all over southeast Michigan that had various kinds of tree ordinances and woodlands ordinances. I think, having worked with the city of Ann Arbor, um, I think it's pretty works out pretty well in Ann Arbor. It's not terribly restrictive, but it's restrictive enough that um, you can't go into a, a lot and remove a house and then cut all the trees down if you, just to build a new house. That doesn't happen in Ann Arbor. You can't do that. You can't prevent development by that ordinance, but you have to justify any of the trees that are removed from a parcel like that. And it's in the planning process that all that is examined. Um, and I, ha I reviewed uh, all uh, plat planning uh, developments. Anything that got up to a, uh, um, the planning department for its review uh, and, and a simple addition to a house uh, wouldn't, would only go through the building part, probably. But if it required a plat, then I reviewed the plat to, to uh, put my two cents in of what trees are being removed and what aren't being removed. And that whole process all of a sudden puts um, in the back of the developer's mind or the property owner's mind, gee, I got to think about why we're doing this because I'm going to have to come up for a, with a good reason to remove trees not just because I don't like them. Um, so in your thing, I think you said that a community should have a goal of 40% canopy? That's just an average that has been set as from the Urban and Community Forestry Council uh, of the DNR as a, a goal to shoot for. OK. Do we, does anyone know what Royal Oak is right now? I know. Well, as of 6, 12, 17, it was 30.5%. That's not too bad. I was expecting to be lower. And how do you know that? Because I read it on the city's website. It was a memo going to the mayor about our tree canopy. Was our canopy assessment done here? Oh, OK. Sure. Yes. The, yeah, maybe they, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, there was. Excellent. <laughs> so in the city of Detroit, what they're doing commonly, and, and I think you're part of that, as you said, about 100 tree plantings, is they're taking unused parks and then now reforesting them. Uh, is that something that you're going to see? We, we haven't been involved in that. That's, it's a different nonprofit that's doing that. Yeah. This was a park that is still maintained by the city of Detroit. And we just enhanced it by adding more trees to the park. There, are, there isn't any ball fields or anything like that in that park anymore. And that's so where they, they're reforesting them instead of just having them set plain and not being used. Yep. And the Royal Oaks got 51 parks. so. Some of them are parcels of land, some of them are really used parks, so it might be an opportunity for us. Yes. Is there a better time of year to plant trees than have these type of community events? Well, it pretty much needs to be in the fall or the spring, but either of those different seasonal times are fine for planting trees. We start planting around the middle of October and go up till Thanksgiving. And then in the spring, we it's normally about the last couple weeks or last week of April, uh, and then it can go well past Memorial Day. The trees that nurseries have that we purchase are from wholesale nurseries, 
And they get trees two times a year. They get them in the spring uh, before bud break. And then they hold that uh, order of trees. They may come in from March until June. The ones that have not been sold at that point, they're held all summer long in excellent conditions, in mulch beds with constant irrigation, monitored irrigation. Um, so the tr those trees can be planted really any time of year. It makes it more difficult for new plantings to survive in the Julys and Augusts if there isn't really conscientious follow-up maintenance. So then we start up again in, in October. But we've done plantings in September, too. Yes. May I just add something why it's so great to plant in fall is because as opposed to spring you have to water all season. In fall you only have to water until the first hard snow comes. That's right. Sure. Because so then it's less taxing on your water bill too. That's right. To plant in fall. That's right. All that snow eventually gets into the ground and it's great for the tree. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice or experience as to what a city can do that's constantly doing battle with its utility? for their overly aggressive tree trimming and tree removal policies, where you know, like DT comes around and they don't just want to trim the tree back because they don't have to come back for five years. So they trim it way down or remove it entirely because it's cost effective for them, but does harm for residents. Have any cities had success in, in scaling back those overly aggressive programs? When, it, when uh, Detroit Edison, Ann Arbor was covered by Detroit Edison, when they were coming to town, they notified our office and we sat down and had a chat with them. And we developed a relationship, I think, where they were more species sensitive to the way they pruned. And we didn't really allow on our right of ways and in our parks, public property, uh, any trees to be removed if they were healthy and not interfering in the wires. And they don't generally get away with that in Ann Arbor <laughs> on the private property either. But they, they had an educational program that, that went out to homeowners that, you know, if you're going to plant underwires, you, you, you should restrict it to these kinds of trees that don't get, or never grow high enough to get into the wires. And we had a pretty good relationship. It wasn't as if they didn't ever get com complaints in Ann Arbor. <clears throat> but it was a lot a much more civilized um, fight with them. Yes. <laughs> I've always been in wanting as many trees as possible on our property that's pretty wooded, and what are your thoughts on this? So often, many of my trees are planted by the birds or whatever. You know, it's junk trees, and I'm constantly battling trying to take out some that are growing too quickly and, and propagate more that are coming up. Do you think it's important to the tree canopy to keep all of your junk trees um, rather than clear them all out? Well, not necessarily all of those. Um, encouraging diversity is good. Having too many of one kind of tree is, is not good. We found that with elms. We've now found it with ash. And, and um, well, oak wilt's a little bit different issue, but, and I can talk about that if somebody has a question. But uh, <clears throat> having reasonable spacing is also very good for a tree's growth and health. So uh, I think of an area, if you're, you're describing, is to thin it of unwanted trees, uh, but maintaining a certain spacing to develop a full canopy if that's what you're after. And then there's a whole list of trees that the DNR can supply you with, we can supply you with, which are good choices for urban areas. Mm -hmm. And various sizes, the mature sizes, so that you can plant some that are only going to get to be 30 feet high, and some that will get to be 80 feet high, and in between. Thank you. Will you talk about oak a little bit and the effects that's Oak, oak wilt is a pretty serious fungus disease that is spread uh, by a beetle, that's a native beetle, uh, but, the, but they don't know whether oak wilt was native or not. It's been in the country for about 60 or 70 years, but it's only been in Michigan fairly recently. 
Um, it clogs up the vessels or the uptake cellular portions of the tree, uh, and they essentially uh, die of desiccation. Um, it's a, it, they don't have good controls once a tree has it. They have uh, treatments to prevent it with injections. And the other part you have to think about is they, it, they spread the disease through their root grafts. If you have two oaks that are close enough together where their roots may intermingle, one can spread it that way too. In fact, it's a very fast way to spread in a wooded area of oaks because their roots uh, expand beyond their branch spread. And if you think about a natural stand of oaks, many of them are only a few feet apart. So that's an issue, in a, particularly in a wooded natural area where they'll come in and they'll do uh, a trenching to cut the root grafts. But you have to, if you've got two trees that show symptoms now, you may have to go 100 yards with that trenching cir circle to stop it. And then there's still the possibility of the beetle. Now the beetle uh, is only attracted to, tree, to trees that have a wound of some kind, a large broken branch, or trees that are, have just been pruned. So the DNR has, uh, and, and we at the Arbor Society of Michigan have been encouraging tree services not to prune trees between April 1st and October 30th. Uh, and that's working out fairly well. Now the utilities, they're under, they're caught between the rock and the hard place because they have to maintain service, they have to do rotational pruning, and they can't leave uh, four months of the year without pruning. So they, they try to schedule more of the oak, their oak areas that have oaks, uh, during the winter times. And there is a, a peak risk period, which is, um, I think it's June 1st to August something, uh, and then the the overlap periods were from April 1st to June 1st. That's a low mid risk. Uh, the safest time is, as I indicated, from uh, winter time from end, mid to end of October to April 1st. But there's a there's less risk of tr transmitting the disease if you're pruning in April than there is in July. Yes. So I've been playing the same thing in my garden for years, and I'm just finally like getting my crop right, like doing something good. And I want to plant a tree this year, and I'm scared I'm going to kill it right away, because I've, you know, like I said, I killed my garden for five years. And <laughs> so if, if I do plant a tree, what kind of maintenance does it need, and you know, is it going to thrive? What first, thrive? first thing is make sure it's planted correctly. There's lots of uh, inexperienced homeowners uh, don't realize that the depth that your root system is at when you plant it is critical. Um, you need to have, if it's a bald and burlap tree, the top of that root ball that's in burlap should be equal to the surrounding grade or just a smidge higher to allow for settling. If it's two inches too low or more, the tree will struggle and it could even die, especially in heavy soils. What they're limiting what is being limited is oxygen. Trees need oxygen in the upper root system. Um, so that's why the root ball needs to be near the surface of the ground. Uh, the next most important thing is water. Uh, fertilizing a new tree is not that big a deal. But water has to be applied uh, prior to significant dehydration or desiccation of the tree. So you have to, in the summertime, when we're getting, or in the springtime, when we're getting rain, just making sure that any of those gaps between rains that you're su uh, supplying on an average three inch tree, maybe uh, 10 to 15 gallons of water. And you can buy what's called a gator. It's essentially a reinforced plastic bag that re you, you fill up the bag, might be 15 or 20 gallons and then it releases the water over, uh, I think, 24 or 48 hour period. 
and then you don't have to stand there forever to get, try to get 15 gallons. Because uh, if you do it at full speed out of your hose, there's very little that 15 gallons is actually going to go in the ground unless you use something like a gator. So it's 15 gallons, is that weekly, is that bi-weekly, depending Generally on the rain? Generally weekly. Okay. Uh, but particularly important, and maybe twice a week, in the worst parts of the summer, when we're getting no rain, and it's a stretch of 85 to 90, uh, then twice a week wouldn't hurt. It's, it's harder to overwater a tree. You can do it, but it's harder to do that than it is to let one dry out. That's real easy to do if you aren't paying attention. Yes? I was wondering if you could clarify, or just make sure I'm understanding correctly, the DTE planning requires in terms of probably two years ago, I had a conversation um, question the level. Do you have to do that now? Or do you have to do that The city took down a series of mature trees under the wires by a park, and they said they would not be replanted because they were under wires. But uh, did I hear you say you can plant under wires? Yes, well, you could, if you take trees down under wires, you can plant new trees someplace else to compensate for that canopy loss. But there are species under standard primaries, which is 40 feet. There are species you can plant that will never get 40 feet. DTE doesn't say, doesn't specify you can't plant under wires anymore? No. Okay. They, they don't have the right. It's your property. They have an easement. They have to maintain their easement, but you have the right to do anything you want on that property, technically, other than cut their poles down. <laughs> yes? Yeah, and I apologize, you know, as a DT employee, I'm going to tell you one thing, though. If you plant under the wires and you go out of power or your neighborhood goes out of power, and it's your tree that does it, shame on you. I, I'm sorry, that's, that's just commonsensical. That's right. You can't play that game of having too tall and too high. You get a tree into the wires, it's going to short out at some point. It's going to rub it raw. It's not a good idea no matter what. So the request of you is to keep the space. It's for your be benefit as well as theirs. Right. I don't know how you expect the wires to go back up if your trees are in the way. So please, I apologize for telling you that, but it should be commonsensical. Don't toy with that. It's just not reasonable. To even it is try. not a good idea it to, really is. to I mean, plant uh, anything yeah. that's going to remotely come close to the wires. Because you're going to, sooner or later, the property owner loses on that. Because Detroit doesn't, has to maintain clearance. And that's a 50, 10 to 15 foot clearance. But it does bring up a good point that they will send you out information, as I'm sure Relief will. When you purchase a tree, try to understand what the canopy is. You know, yeah. how wide your tree is going to get. Not just how tall it's going to get. But most of these trees can have 40 to 50 foot, you know, births on them. So that means if you plant it within 20 feet of the wire, sooner or later, those limbs are just going oh, to Oh, yeah, if you plant tall so try trees to understand. Yeah. and you think you're far enough off the pole yeah. center line, yeah. you have to pay attention to the spread of the tree also. I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's a lot of what the pruning is uh, with Detroit Edison. They have to clear, clear the sides of trees because they get into the wires because maples and oaks will grow to be 100 feet. And that's way above a 40 foot wire. Yes? Bill, yes. this probably isn't for you, but there may be somebody here that can address the question. Uh, Royal Oak just went to single stream recycling of our uh, waste. And in the process, they have now new trucks that pick up these containers, take them quite high in the air, and dump the contents in the truck. In the process, they hit tree branches. The, the trees are not using uh, set for this type of uh, lift operation underneath them. I'm just wondering if there's anyone present that can address that and uh, you know, what the city might be doing or what we can do as private homeowners to address this type of potential broken branches. I never was able to uh, <coughs> dictate to the solid waste division what kind of equipment they should buy. But we had lots of talks about uh, being conscious of, of trees because it damaged the trucks too a lot in many cases. And that's real expensive. So we had a few over the years where uh, somebody would get too close, but I think it was an educational thing with the drivers um, in Ann Arbor where 
they became very much more conscientious about uh, where they, how close they can dr uh, drive those trucks to the curb on certain streets. And it has to do with where you put your bin. I mean, if you can move it, you know, another three feet over, you might be able to just miss. That's the right. Bin. They now most of them have the arm that picks the bin up and does that, and that has some a distance, uh, additional reach, which is good. But it's it's really communications between the forester. Um, the city administrator about the importance of trees and for those other departments to be conscientious when they're on those streets with big equipment. So it's you plow, the snow plow trucks, yeah. we had the same Everybody problem. Else snow plow trucks did the, do the same thing and they have to go to the curb. Mm -hmm. So that then it's my responsibility when trees get bigger and dot trunk diameter and, br and do this, is to prune them so they won't get beaten up by the truck. Yeah, I had a question about, um, often we find that some of the trees in high traffic areas where there's a lot of salt that we use to keep the roads obviously clear in the winter, that salt residue over the years is problematic for the trees. Can you speak to some of the uh, conditions that we have to be aware of and maybe some better ways that we can Approach that problem. I know in the residential streets, you know, we have cars that drag in the salt. It's it's not as abundant, but on a lot of our main roads and at intersections where we're doing primary salting for safety, and you know, I imagine that's harmful for the trees. It, it is harmful for the trees, and it's a losing proposition if you don't consider that when you're planting and you're designing a landscape. Uh, we try to uh, push the tree away from the curve as far as we can with new space. In streets such as Stadium Boulevard in Ann Arbor, we got permission for all the homeowners to plant behind the sidewalk. And I tried to get the engineering department to consider designing residential streets with the sidewalk only three feet behind the curb and an easement that extended well beyond that to plant all trees behind the sidewalk. Well, they use the sidewalks too close to the street is dangerous for the side pedestrians. But in subdivisions where traffic volumes are extremely low, I'm not fine. Some cities have done it. I could never convince Ann Arbor. But in my opinion, that was a, a real win-win uh, situation because there's a three to four foot strip to put all that snow and not have anybody uh, upset about it with a sidewalk. And then a street tree behind the sidewalk that benefits the property owner even more than it would have moved between the sidewalk and the curb, that street tree. And generally, the property owners are glad to let you take care of you, the city. I'm um, just looking towards the future, like here in Royal Oak, we go to the neighborhood over by Lexington and the riots across from the senior center over there. And they've given them so many variances, I guess you call them, or they allow them to build as many houses as close together as they can with as little land. There's probably less than three feet of an easement between the curb and the sidewalk. So maybe we could plant a small tree, but if it's any decent tree like an elm or an oak or a maple, before it's even 20% of its growth, it's going to have to be cut down because there's just no room to grow a tree. And the same thing between the sidewalk and the front of the house. There's probably only about 10 or 12 feet at the most between there. So again, you can't even plant a tree in front of the house. So how is that going to affect tree canopies in the future? Well, they're going to allow them to build neighborhoods. I don't want to um, be critical of people, but that's poor planning, in my opinion. Definitely. Uh, community planning. If you only have a three-foot extension of sidewalk and a three or four feet till you have a house front, a setback. I, I can't even imagine that. It would never be allowed in Ann Arbor. Well, I hear it. And lots of communities, I don't think that would be allowed. Most, a lot of communities have a minimum distance between a sidewalk and the curb that you're even allowed to plant a tree. And a three foot's usually that minimum. 
anything three foot or smaller, <coughs> you've got to think of something else. Plant it on the back side. Um, and it depends on the size of the tree. You can get upright trees that'll, that'll have a small space above ground. But it, it's still a difficult chore to get that to work. And if it's a busy street, salt will pretty much ruin that try, that attempt. Somebody, woman back here is going to, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, with all your know-how how to plant trees, what is your success rate um, on the mass planting? I'm just addressing that question that came up on Facebook. Well, we planted in Ann Arbor, we planted both Burl and Burlap trees and bare root trees which are trees that are ordered from commercial nurseries and they come in with no, no dirt on the roots. But they're maintained properly at the nursery. They're maintained all the way in the shipping process. They have to be in an enclosed truck. We put them into a wood chip pile and it's watered and it's a very successful. We, we usually, I would say we had anywhere from 75 to 85% with bare root and probably 85 on up to with ball and burlap trees. Okay. There were circumstances that didn't, wasn't that successful for a variety of reasons, but over the 40 or 28 years I was there, I think our, our average probably would have been at least 75%. Thank you. And also, if I can ask one more question, um, the ordinance that you have regarding tree removal from private property, if we're doing those are specific types of trees, not like that's something that's held with value, like an old or maple. Um, did you have any pushback? How long has that ordinance been around? I have a feeling that Royal Oak be a little bit more divided. Than well, I, there's a lot of pushback in the beginning. Any, any communities had that. Yeah, that's true. But it's an educational process. The, yeah. the value of having an ordinance like that to a community, I think, is priceless. Um, yeah, we, uh, it, was, it was treated in two different categories, as I think I mentioned part of. One was an undeveloped parcel with a subdivision uh, wanting to be developed. That had very strict uh, uh, restrictions, but it didn't prevent them from building a subdivision. They had to do two things. They had to maintain conservation easements on perimeters. They had, to, they had to include a portion of their subdivision development as a city park and leave trees there. And they had to supply trees for the streets, an escrow. They had to pay money based on the footage, front foot, uh, for, for trees. And that, that's Ann Arbor, because of that little park deal, we have 160 parks in Ann Arbor, uh, about 24, 2,500 acres. And half of that 2,500 acres is parks that are undeveloped, which is probably the most, <laughs> most wonderful part of Ann Arbor. <clears throat> and we maintain them that way. Yes? Could you compare the, the value of a, a dwarf type tree, which only gets what would be about what, 30 feet high, versus let's say going with a maple that could be 100 foot? Are you still seeing the, those counted into the canopy? Uh, with these smaller lots that we're hearing, uh, a dwarf type tree might work, whereas a, a large tree will not. Right. Yes, it's still in, included in that canopy if there are overstory trees above it. Okay. And in many places in urban areas, that is all you'll see in some places is crab apples and lots of ornamentals like that. That's still part of the canopy when there isn't an overstory above it. Mm -hmm. Yes? The wick? I don't think I have. And it's current research on tree roots being the sustaining factor in the life and um, coordination efforts that go on underground to prevent invasive species. They literally talk to each other and a tree will chemically let another tree know that there's an invasive species. And then they start sending out certain toxins to prevent that beetle from, so only part of the forest is affected 
the rest of the forest doesn't get the beetle. So when you were talking about this trenching, I was thinking that really runs in the face of what this book is, is research is showing, in, at least in a forest environment. I don't know about urban environments. Well, there's lots of oak wilt in forested areas too, unfortunately. Yeah. And the, the, the process you're talking about exists in nature uh, with all plants to a certain extent. But in the case of uh, epidemic type outbreaks or large outbreaks, uh, it's, it can't be, it's not really successful in what, preventing diseases. What happened with the, um, the beetle that we had here that was decimating? Uh, emerald ash borer. Yeah. Is it still decimating our forest? Not so much because there's not that much ash left. Oh, now the, okay. the answer to that is uh, breeding resistant ash, which they are in the process of doing that. Uh, we will never lose our ash, just like we never lost our elms. Right. They just, we don't have them in the numbers we used to. Right. But Mother Nature doesn't allow a species generally to be completely wiped out by a, a bug or a pest. They will, their numbers will get so low that the bug population collapses, and the bug po population never completely dies out, but there's not enough... Um, members around to completely uh, eliminate a tree species. So the ashes are always coming up. A lot of them don't get very big anymore, but I, I'm, I feel in some time, uh, 40, 50 years, we'll have ash back again because resistant varieties will be found. That's the other thing Mother Nature does. Yes, yeah, but we don't like, all understand. There are, there are resistant elm varieties, which there were there are more and more of them in the last 10 years uh, that they've been working on for 25 years. And they're pretty successful, and they're being used a lot more in landscapes and in cities. Yes? Can you touch on how to put mulch around a tree? Thank you for asking <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've all seen where mulch gets put up around a trunk like this. I call it volcano mulching. Because if you look at just the mulch, it's shaped like a volcano. But that's hard on a tree. Uh, the trunk can rot, trunk bark can rot from too much moisture being in contact with the bark for too long of a period. So um, all a tree needs is in the way of mulch is a couple inches. And I even recommend leaving an inch, inch thick mulch. I would even recommend leaving an inch away from the trunk with no mulch. Because what you're trying to do is reduce the loss of moisture through, from the soil uh, with that mulch and insulate the roots to a certain extent through the winter. Uh, and it, we don't need it up around the trunk. We need it out where the feeder roots are, which is closer to where the branches extend. A friend of mine calls it a donut. Exactly. Yep, that donut's right. Yes? A mulch also helps so you don't hit the trunk of the tree if you're yes. a weed whacker or you're on. Yeah. Weed, wh weed whip disease. <laughs> Can you go back to the subject of disease resistant elms? I get solicitations probably at least twice a year from a company trying to sell us elm trees. And well, I'm very reluctant to go in that direction. I grew well, up in the street it's good to lost every tree. It's good to be cautious because lots of them have not been proved to be that uh, successful. But all I can suggest, call our office. We can give you a lot of the varieties you can look for that commercial nurseries will have some of, at least, on, on general, generally every season. Now, I'm dealing mostly with wholesale nurseries. Commercial nurseries are a little bit fussy because they're only smelling, selling small volumes uh, and they're selling to the general public who want to see a tree that's low maintenance and one that's beautiful only and beautiful color and a flower. and So they have, they're more uh, fussy about what they're going to try to pick out. But uh, there are a lot of them available. And call our office. We can send you a list. You can actually 
probably from the DNR's website get their list of resistant elm species. Um, the oh, what's the elm? Elm Research Institute. That would be another website source you could try, um, that, and you might, and they probably have a list of resistant varieties. Were you planting elms in our Yep. We also we, before there were very many um, resistant varieties. We were planting Zelkova, which is an Asian cousin. It has a very upright, same shape leaf, same shape tree. It just didn't get to be 120 feet tall like an American elm does. Um, we have quite a few of them now. And then we started, as the, there were more and more varieties, resistant varieties available, they've started planting. I didn't get a chance. Uh, we, I left in uh, 02, and there weren't a great deal. Uh, there were some, and we used some. <clears throat> but there are lots of varieties now. Yes? I actually have a question for anybody in the city uh, addressing this man's uh, concern about uh, these big houses going up with big easements. Yeah. Uh, do we have a plan? Does anybody look at this stuff, or is our plan to just let contractors do whatever they want? Or is our plan just to not have any plan? The city, yeah. the city has regulations as far as what can be put on a, a property, and there's a regulation as far as how large that footprint can be. With regard to regulating trees coming down, that's one of the things that we want to talk about. I know Abby's circulating petition to get residents support for uh, the commission advancing some sort of ordinance that would regulate the removal of trees on private property. What's important to recognize is we can't just say it would be for builders only. If we say there's an ordinance restricting removal of trees, it's for all of us, not just someone that's, you know, doing a new build on a property. So is there an ordinance or not? Yeah, so Abby's circulating a petition to, to encourage the city to get what we need to know, because it's going to be a divisive issue because you get into property rights, right? So we, I want to know that there's strong public support for this. I want to have that conversation. That's why we're kicking it off with this conversation tonight. And to answer your question more specifically, we have setbacks. We have, you know, depending on the zoning, single-family home. There are um, provisions in place, lock covers, things like that. But what is missing? It seems like we're giving these contractors uh, variances all the time. I mean, they're going well, to no, 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 we're not. True at all. No. Um, what we're what we're giving is what you would be entitled to your property. If you had, let's say, you want to build a deck on the back of your house, and there was a, a tree in the way, and at this point, Royal Oak, you're allowed to cut down that tree and build your deck. I'm not thinking about trees. I'm just talking about square footage. Yeah, they're mostly just maximizing what the ordinance allows. They're not right. running variances beyond that. We That's very, right. very rarely grant someone the ability to go occupy larger than the percentage that they're allowed to on their lot. They'd have to That's really prove uh, hardship, and that actually goes to the zoning board, and they would have to approve that variance because they had a, some sort of legitimate hardship. Right, and most of our homes, you know, are, are bungalows and our, our, our ranches that, you know, are this huge portion of our housing stock, they're, they're far below what, what city ordinance allows. So when the bigger homes go up, they're not going beyond what's allowed. They're, they're maximizing what's allowed under current law because most of the homes are much smaller than the lot they're on allows. I don't want to, I don't want to, because the libraries. I think we're about to get kicked out of the library. So I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight to start this conversation and we'll continue. And let's thank um, Bill and Abby.